so again, uh, welcome, welcome back to uh, Boston Azure. This is our second virtual event. We're trying to adjust to uh, coronavirus just like everybody else. Uh, and um, hopefully we're, uh, we're figuring out how to get over all the technical difficulties a little bit at a time. I'm here, I'm joined by uh, Jason Haley, whose first voice you already heard, and uh, Ver Veronica uh, Kolznikova, who uh, uh, between the three of us, we do most of the running of the Boston Azure and North Boston Azure groups. And we're joining forces for this uh, while we're in virtual mode. And our hope is to have an event like this every couple of weeks. We had one two weeks ago. And we have one planned for, I guess, not exactly two weeks from tonight, but uh, 13 days from tonight, so on a Wednesday. And then we have another one uh, queued up after that. We're going to try and keep it going. Where, uh, as I mentioned, the technical difficulties, which is always fun as we, you know, shift into a new delivery approach. Uh, so if you have feedback for us, um, you know, of course, uh, reach out. Uh, uh, you um, coding out loud at gmail.com for me, and um, you can reach us on Twitter. You, you can see our uh, Twitter handles here for the, for the groups at least. Um, it's actually probably not the greatest way to reach us personally though. Uh, I'll think about that at, uh, at the end. Uh, actually in Slack is a great way to reach us now that that's what I was about to talk about next. So we're, we're, trying, we're experimenting with new technologies. Of course, we have Teams and there's a chat feature on Teams. You can ask questions on Teams, but we also wanted to experiment with um, use of Slack as a side channel during the meeting. So if you join the Boston Azure Slack and you see the, hopefully the bit.ly link is on screen, it's uh, bit.ly slash, and then all lowercase BA Slack, short for Boston Azure Slack. If you follow that link, you can, with a couple of clicks, you can get an invitation to the Boston Azure Slack uh, project and then once you're in there you can go to a slack channel that's named just for tonight which is called uh it's a it, it's called um darn it i think i have the wrong name in there it's called meeting hyphen 30 hyphen apr hyphen 2020 i'll have to fix that um and then um So you can, I'll be in there, Veronica, Jason, the three of us will be kind of running in the background with while uh, our guest speaker is uh, doing his thing. And um, so, so you know, comments on the meeting, how it's going, if you have questions, we can queue them up and uh, maybe answer some of them, et cetera. So it's our, you know, we're still trying to figure this out. That's our, that's our side channel. So we can join Slack. Uh, just to notice, um, you know, if you do ask a, a question, you may show up on the video recording of this. This is being recorded and we do plan to uh, publish to the YouTubes. Um, we're not sure every talk will be published, uh, depends on certain things, but there's the possibility that if you have a question in there, you may appear there. So just FYI, uh, be warned. All right, so without uh, I think I got all my points here. Without um, further ado, let me switch into uh, introduction mode here, where we're very glad to welcome back to Boston Azure and to North Boston Azure. He's a repeat uh, visitor here. And I think we have a slide here for him. Uh, this is uh, uh, Toyob uh, Ali, and he's a SQL MVP. And he enlightened us uh, in, in the past about, um, I remember one of his uh, excellent talks was on um, DR with uh, Azure SQL DB. And he has expertise in many areas. And we're fortunate enough here tonight to uh, hear from him about uh, SQL agents and what do you do when, when you don't have one. So I'll let, uh, uh, I'll let him um, uh, you know, further introduce himself and uh, join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to our second ever virtual speaker, Toyob Ali. We'll do a cup clap thing. And uh, I will hand it over to you, sir. Thank you.
Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Jason and Veronica for hosting me. I think this is the third time I'll be presenting to one of the group. I don't in once. I think I presented to the Jason's one other one other time in Cambridge. So but thank you for hosting me again. So let me share my screen. It okay, looks like there's a lag between. OK. Yeah, you're good. There's definitely a lag between if you're watching a live video versus what you see on your teams, there's like a 20 second delay. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to wait for the screen to come up, but I can start uh, and I thanks others for joining and uh, you know, pat yourself in the back because you know after a whole day of work, I know with current situation, you're working from home with a lot of challenges with children. Uh, you know, home has become a playground, a school, uh, workplace, office, and then you know you are hanging out at 6 p.m., uh, uh, which you know you should be uh, you should be proud of yourself. At least you know that's how I think about it. You know, I have four here at home to take care. My wife and I both work, uh, so it's not easy. So we'll be talking about Azure SQL Database. And as Bill said, what do we do when we do not have a SQL agent? And this was a challenge for me. Uh, it's still a challenge that I haven't solved all my problems as uh, I'm migrating to Azure Cloud slowly. Uh, you know, I'm figuring out things. So I thought, you know, uh, some of the options that I figured out and I played with, I'm going to share those. Uh, that might uh, help your journey to uh, cloud a little bit easier. Uh, so we'll probably talk for about 20 minutes and then the rest of the time I'll show you demo, uh, you know, between different options. So one of the question I get when I, you know, talk about this, people will ask me and I asked that to Microsoft long time ago. I remember, you know, why bother with this? Why can't I just spin up managed instance where I have a SQL Server agent and if you look at the pricing the way they priced the azure sql database and the managed instance so to get the same compute and same storage in a managed instance you'll be probably paying twice and microsoft knew about that uh, and that's how they priced it because they don't expect everyone to move from on-prem to managed instance uh, so, but you know, if you can afford the money, go for it. And you know, then you do not need uh, many of the stuff that I'm going to show you. Uh, but you know, if you're like me, work for a company that has a fixed budget, trying to save money, um, then some of this will help you out. Okay, so we'll have a problem with the slides because uh, you know I I move to the next slide, but you guys can't see it. Uh, so I'm just going to. Uh, talk about that and uh, when the slide comes, um, you know, bear with it. It's a, it's a nuisance, I understand, but uh, I think that's the fact of the technology that we are using today. Uh, so a little bit about myself, the next slide, and I don't want to spend much time. Uh, if you want to take any note is my contact. Uh, if I do not answer anything, if you have comments uh, or if you want to follow up further, uh, you can uh, use any of this method. LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, email me. You, uh, I have a contact page on my uh, website. You can use that and I can assure you that, you know, I'll get back to you probably within two days max. So. Why do you use SQL Server Agent? Um, you know, I always try to avoid business logic uh, to run by SQL Server Agent because there are other enterprises scheduler that people can use uh, like I work for a financial industry, a financial investment management firm. Uh, we get a lot of feed, uh, you know, every day, like a lot of data, a lot of uh, raw data from different places and they need to get processed overnight for the fund managers to look in the morning. So we use something called Tidal uh, and if they need to run some T-SQL, I, you know, I help them write it, but I rather, uh, you know, a enterprise scheduler 
schedule those. So in that case, if those fails, because I do not know all the logics of the business, so someone else, you know, from the expert with the application can look at it. Because for me, the only reason I look at it is it failed and I have to wake them up. So why not, you know, they get the alert at the first, uh, uh, you know, in the first place. So some of the stuff that I put here that I use SQL Server Agent on-prem or I have been using for many years, I listed those. And if you're moving to Azure SQL Database, I think many of these uh, are still valid, right? If I have a long running query, uh, that if I, you know, if I see my average for last week was X, and now if it's running, if it's running 1.5 X on the same time of the day of the week, I want to know if I have important process that's blocked by something, and it's time sensitive. I want to know. Uh, I might want to purge old data in batches. Uh, index maintenance, you know, nowadays it's a. Uh, people have very strong opinion. You can see in the public blog, uh, even some of the Microsoft engineers are coming against it. So it's up to you. You know, you might have a case that you might have to do index maintenance. Uh, you might be on the other side of the fence, but definitely update stats. Update stats is a big thing, and I'll show you a couple of demo that we still need to do, even though we moved to Azure SQL Database. So how do we achieve this? Uh, while we were on-prem, it was pretty easy for us, right? We write the code. Um, either in T-SQL or PowerShell. Uh, we go to SQL Server agent, schedule it and forget about it. We set up some alert. If it fails, uh, you know, we can get alert. So very simple. Now moving to Azure SQL database, we don't have that option. So what I'm going to talk about is most of the people today in the cloud journey, either probably in a hybrid mode. And what I mean by that, they still probably have some hardware, some SQL Server running on-prem, and some in cloud. And some people might say, you know, when I talk to people, yes, we moved in six months, 100%. And when you ask them a further question, what model you are using, uh, most of them will say that I'm using a IIS model. And when I say IIS, is infrastructure as a service, means you get the VM from Microsoft, but you still uh, can decide what um, OS you want and uh, what version of SQL Server you want, uh, you know, what patches you want to put in. And, um, you know, you do not take care of the hardware directly, but you take care of your operating system, you take care of your SQL Server version. So it will look like as an on-prem SQL Server. So if you still have those around, uh, you can leverage those and we'll talk about it. And if you're 100% cloud, uh, then you do not have the option, you know, some of the option that I'm going to show you. But for those folks, uh, I'll show you some of the options that are totally, you know, cloud services. So let's talk about some example. What can we do on-prem if you're using on-premise uh, SQL Server? We can create a link server pointing to Azure SQL database. And once we have a link server established, uh, we can do pretty much anything we do with on-prem SQL Server. So if I have a link server, I can collect information from there. Uh, I can have SQL Server agent jobs pointing to that. Now, if you have many of those, right? If you have hundreds or thousands of Azure SQL database, um, you have to create a link server for each one. And uh, that might not be ideal, right? To maintain all those, iterate those uh, through those uh, might not be an easy task. Uh, then PowerShell can come handy because in PowerShell with different modules now, uh, you can loop through objects pretty easy. So I can have a bunch of link servers and I can put them in object and loop through those and do whatever I want to do. So that can solve one problem. Other way you can do a combination of PowerShell and you can use Windows Scheduler. And if you, you can use on-prem host or you can use IIS VM. With Windows Scheduler, you can schedule a date and time or any frequency you want and you can call a PowerShell function what that PowerShell code or your own function can go through all your 
Azure SQL database and do whatever you want. Or you can use a third party scheduler, like I said, Tidal. There are other ones you might be using. Uh, you can leverage those uh, using your link server pointing to your Azure SQL database. I already talked about IIS model, um, so it really doesn't change much. So, but one point I'll mention that I saw some of the people use this solution. Say you have few hundred Azure SQL database and you really, your company's goal is to go to, uh, you know, either PaaS or um, you know, a SaaS model, but not an IIS model. And when I say PaaS means platform as a service, uh, means you do not get a hardware, you do not control your OS, you do not control your SQL Server version, you get the SQL Server engine and you just, uh, and you get compute and you work with it. Uh, so if that's your company's model, uh, you can always spin up a single VM, install a SQL Server, and use that agent pointing to all other Azure SQL database and do your work. Uh, do your maintenance, do whatever you need to do. That can be a solution. And the last one is a pass. So if you do not have anything and you are dead against that, I do not want to use any on-premise and I don't have anything, you do not want to use IS model and you're totally into PaaS. Um, so there are Azure Automation, which is a service itself. Azure Function, itself a service. Elastic Job Agent is a combination. You still use the Azure SQL database because for Elastic Job Agent to work, you need, a, you need Azure SQL database to host your metadata, and I'll show that, and web jobs. So I'm not going to talk about web jobs. You know, I myself is not a developer, uh, you know, not a full-time developer, but I have seen that people using web jobs to solve some of these problems. So I just mentioned it, but I'm going to show demo on the top three in PaaS model. And if you want to know that, you know, what out of all these solutions that I'm talking about, what resembles like our on-prem MSDB, right? So MSDB database kind of holds all your metadata about your SQL Server agent, all your job definitions, job schedules, and all that. Elastic job agents uh, looks pretty similar, and actually I think Microsoft copied some of the code that go against MSDB, and I'll show you some of those objects that created once you turn that on. And uh, they look pretty similar to what we see on prem today. So I talked about link server. The next slide is coming up. Uh, it's going to show you a picture uh, that you know how you can design this. So it's no different than adding a link server today to our on-premise uh, SQL Server that it point to a different SQL Server. In this case, you'll be pointing to cloud, to your Azure SQL database, and uh, then you know it's pretty much same as what we do on-prem today. And the next slide I'm talking about a combination of PowerShell and Windows Scheduler. Um, so I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, you guys will probably see it for a second. And um, because I'm going to demo this. So the next you're going to talk about Azure Automation. And Azure, Azure, Azure Automation itself is a service, as I said before, uh, it's a cloud based. And uh, you do not need to maintain any hardware for it. You do not need to acquire any hardware. Um, you do not even need to uh, acquire any compute power. It's all, uh, you know, it's all built in for you as a package. And the primary component of a automation is a runbook. And today you can run a, uh, you can write a runbook using PowerShell or Python. And if you go to the PS gallery, which you can do it from the GUI and uh, from the portal, which I'll show you, um, there's a PowerShell gallery and you can actually import uh, many runbooks that people already wrote and share um, there. And uh, you know you can import it to your automation account, and you can modify, or you can write it from scratch. And uh, also you can write graphical uh, runbooks, 
which if you ask me that something similar to like uh, if you created uh, SSIS packages, uh, you can drag drop uh, different objects and you know glue them together. Uh, you can do something like that. Uh, you know if you do not want to start writing from scratch. And I'm not going to go into details into runbook types, uh, but uh, if you go to this route, I definitely will urge you to look at. Uh, there's two major difference between a PowerShell runbook and a PowerShell workflow runbook. And the main difference is PowerShell workflow runbooks can keep its status. So if it fails, you can restart from that point. Uh, it knows uh, where it is. Uh, but a PowerShell workflow, uh, it does not preserve its state. So if it fails, you have to start from the beginning. Uh, you can also, like I said, you can also have uh, Python runbooks. You can schedule runbooks. One problem with the scheduling runbook that I find, if you have a time critical SQL Server agent job uh, that you want to start at a certain hour, minute, and second, uh, this will be a problem for you because once you trigger a runbook to run, it goes into queue, it acquires the compute, and then it starts running. So you really cannot pinpoint to that exact second. Uh, in runbooks, you can share a lot of resources like credentials, certificates, connections. You create those once. Many different runbooks can share those. Uh, there is source control integration. Uh, there is run as account. Uh, you can create and then you can take that account and uh, you can give it privilege at a different level. You can give it to an individual Azure SQL database. You can give it to a resource group. You can even give it as a subscription level. So you do not have to give it to all the resources under a subscription. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but if you're interested, uh, look up Azure, is, uh, Azure Runbook can also manage your on-prem resources. So today, if you're setting this up, uh, you can even come back to on-prem and manage uh, some of your on-prem resources uh, like your VMs, your patching, um, uh, you know, some of your compliance requirement, uh, you can manage uh, using the Runbooks. So, OK, so let me. So you have a lag, so I'm just going to read you know, what I'm looking at in my slide. Uh, so with the Azure automation, we can do a couple of things. Uh, you know, definitely you can you know, schedule your repetitive jobs. Uh, can save us you know, time and money because uh, uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to do the same thing over and over. Uh, you can also, you know, maintain your patching. So, like your Windows, Linux systems, or if you have hybrid environments, uh, you, by Runbook, uh, you can do, you know, do those tasks too. So next, I want to talk about uh, function apps. And when I first look at the function apps, Azure Function App is itself a service. Uh, I was not encouraged because, uh, you know, before the Ignite last year, I could not use PowerShell in Azure Function Apps. So, but in Ignite, uh, you know, they announced, and I'm going to show you a demo today, how we can use uh, PowerShell pointing to Azure SQL Database, and we can uh, do an update stats, or we can rebuild the index uh, using a function. And when function apps first, uh, you know, I looked at it, there were a couple of uh, limitations. Like as you can see on the screen, the max run time was 10 minutes. And uh, you also did not, you could not reserve compute for yourself. So every time you trigger a function, you have to wait. It goes to a queue, same as the you know your run books, before it starts running. Uh, now with the premium service, you can reserve your own compute, 
and uh, those will be reserved for you. Of course, you'll be paying for those, but the good part is you do not have to wait. As soon as you trigger your run, it is going to go on the computer and it's going to run. And language wise, it can use C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Python, and PowerShell. Again, it has continuous integration with GitHub, uh, DevOps, uh, you know, so, you know, whatever source control you are using, uh, it will work with those. So the next slide, I'm talking about a few of the stuff that was uh, announced uh, in 2019 in Ignite. And I think the big thing is a guaranteed pre warm instances to avoid cold start. And uh, you can have up to 60 minutes of runtime. Um, and automatic management of the dependencies. And what I mean by that, so if you have a PowerShell function or your, your, your sorry, your function is depending on a select DBA tools, which is a very famous open source uh, free library for managing you know, SQL Server assets. And you wrote a function that depended on a version. Uh, that's not dependent on any version. Say you want to get the new version when they release it. Uh, you do not have to do anything. It will automatically get the new version for you. But if you are a version dependent, say like uh, just pick an example, if you are a minor version dependent, say 3.8, and you mention that in your uh, code, it will not upgrade. And if you say I'm not dependent on minor version, I'm only depending on the major version, and you can say three dot star. Anytime a new minor version get released, um, your function app will automatically manage those. So you do not have to manage the dependencies, which is pretty cool. Uh, so one thing, when you first add a function and you run it for first time, you will see that the runtime is a little bit longer because it's really getting all the dependencies and setting this up for you. So next we'll talk about Elastic Job Agent. And it has two components. So one, first you need a Elastic Database. Um, uh, you need Azure SQL Database. And Microsoft has some recommendation. I put a URL at the end. Uh, you know what size of uh, Azure SQL database you should get. Uh, minimum. And uh, that database. Will save your metadata, so all your job definitions, your targets. And. You can also write your output into the same Azure SQL database. Say like if I'm collecting. Um, like all my Azure SQL database size, I want to collect at you know frequent interval to check my growth. Uh, I can bring that data and write it, so you can write it there, or you can write it to a different in your DBA warehouse. And in my demo, I'll show you that I'll have two databases. One is for my job metadata, and I'll have a warehouse where I'm going to write all the outputs. So, what can be your target for your? Uh, Elastic jobs. Your target can be a single Azure SQL database. Your target can be a logical server, means all the databases uh, belong to that logical server. Uh, you can have Elastic Pool. So every database in that Elastic Pool will be your target. So you can have a job that will go and run against all Azure SQL database belong to that Elastic Pool. Uh, so in your job DB database, you create your login, you create credentials, then you take those credentials and to your targets, and you give them appropriate permission or privilege. Say for example, you are just reading, then they need to be a part of the DB data reader group member of that group if they have to write something modify something so you are it's the same as on prem right uh, if you want an account to do something it has to have the right permission so you know you, exactly it's the same concept uh, so i you know on the right side of this slide i show you the four major component we talked about you need a job agent we'll we'll show that target group job database and your jobs and you can also schedule jobs. And the next slide I just copy pasted uh, from books online. I have the URL at the bottom. It just 
giving seven examples of different combinations of target, uh, what a target can be. Uh, so one thing I didn't mention when I talked about target, I can have a target of elastic pool or a Azure SQL a logical server. And I mentioned that all databases will be member of the, uh, you know, of the target, so you can exclude also. So you can say, OK, go against this. Elastic pool. Uh, but exclude DB2 as you can see on the third. Uh, you know, on the left side on the third one, there is a red X. It's saying that do not. Deploy my code against DB2. <coughs> Sorry. The next slide I'm showing that some of the tables, views and store procs. That get created when you turn on your elastic job agent. And if you see some of these um, like on the third block. You will see that it says SP start job. SP stop job, SP update job. Uh, they are pretty similar uh, what we have today on prem in MSDB. Right, we can go open SSMS and we can say SP start job and we can give a job name it starts. So, uh, so and 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 if you look at the code, they are pretty similar to what we have on prem today. We're going to move to demo. I'm done with the slide. Um, so for demo, I'm using 2019. Uh, On-prem SQL Server with CU4. I'm using SSMS uh, Management Studio 18.5, the latest version of uh, Visual Studio Code uh, to show you some of the PowerShell and PowerShell Core uh, 7.0. Bill. Uh, it's probably a good time to take any questions if there are uh, before I move to demo. Excellent idea. Uh, Toyo, I, I don't think we have any questions queued up in on the um, team streaming side. I'm jumping over to Slack to take a quick look. I'm curious, you, you mentioned um, this question for me that you're, you know, you just mentioned the tool set you're using. I'm wondering if you have any uh, experience with uh, Azure Data Studio which seems to be a computer, uh, you know, competing offering or a newer offering than uh, SQL Server Management Studio. Yes, so it's a it's a good question. So I've been I've been start using um, Azure Data Studio mainly for notebooks. So some of the uh, you know I find it's it's really helpful. Um, you know, if I have to send a piece of code with few line of sample data. You know, I don't have to send a thousand rows. If I want to send a query with the 10 rows of data, I can package it with some comments and send it to people. Um, I haven't explored if any of this will be, will be, I'll be, I'll be able to do with that. And I also think that in a long run, probably in a year or two, We'll see a merger of Management Studio and Azure Data Studio. Uh, today it's not there. There are very specific use cases that when you should use what, uh, especially uh, for you know for us who are operational DBAs. Uh, one challenge is uh, with the execution plan. I know Sentry One has a plugin. Uh, uh, I think there is a little bit more work to do. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. But uh, I haven't explored to mimic any functionality of SQL Server agent with uh, uh, with with, with, the, with the Azure SQL Studio to answer your question directly. Very good. Yeah, thanks for for the context. And I'll remind the audience that you're welcome to drop. Uh, so there are no questions at this time. Uh, if you have uh, questions, folks, please either drop them into Slack in the uh, meeting specific channel or uh, directly into Teams, and we'll uh, pick them up at the next uh, interval. So. Back to you, uh, Sorry. Sure, and and you know we'll have some pause. And I'll be running stuff uh, against cloud. Uh, you know, there's certain times we just have to give it a f you know few seconds, and I can uh, answer those questions during that time. So great. So we'll so we'll f so it, take that uh, taking that. Uh, so I'll feel free to if there's a like a time sensitive question on context, I'll interrupt sure. you at a pause. Sure. So one thing I did uh, uh, again, you know, there's a lag between my screen and your uh, what are you seeing? Okay, 
So before uh, you know, we started the meeting, uh, I ran this whole setup code. And uh, or just so you know, uh, all of this code and slide, uh, I'll send the link to Jason or Bill after this meeting, and uh, you can download as is, do whatever you need. You don't need to ask me. Feel free to use it. Uh, if you have any feedback, send me. Uh, you know, to, to improve. I'm, I'm very open about it. So I ran all this code that you see on this. Uh, it takes about 30 plus minute. And what it did, uh, it created two Azure SQL server, bunch of databases, um, and, you know, loaded some data. Uh, and because I do not think it's appropriate for me to, you know, uh, keep you guys here and show that I'm running this. So this is pretty much set up. And what I did, I put everything in a resource group, and this is a good practice. Um, if you are not, you know, working with Azure for a while, uh, you put everything in a resource group. At the end, I just go and remove the resource group. That way, I do not have to go and delete every resource manually. It's just a good, you know, good housekeeping, especially if you have limited money. Uh, you know, this can. Um, you know your money can you can stretch it a lot you know if you you know delete your stuff after you're done so as i talked about the first one we're going to talk about uh, using a link server so i'll start the demo when you guys see the screen and here i'm using a on prem 2019 sql server with cu4 and what this script is going to do uh, before we do anything, um, I'm going to be creating a DBA database on prem. And I'm just going to create a small table to save my database sizes. And I'm going to pull this database size for my Azure SQL database in cloud. I wish this was <laughs> the lag was a little bit less, but uh, just bear with me. So you guys are looking at a recording right now uh, because I have another computer. I logged in as a attendee, so I already ran that script and. Uh, you're kind of looking at a recording right now, so I'll probably do the next part, so. So as you saw, I created that table. And uh, next I'm creating a link server. And this link server is pointing to a Azure SQL database. Uh, what I just created with my setup script. So this is pointing to my UG demo target server, which is in the in the cloud. And using that link server. Okay, let me run the script first, then when it comes there, maybe I should talk. It's probably a better way. So now I'm running this script using the link server, going to cloud and getting the database size. And I saved it locally. So now I'm looking at the result. As you can see that, look at the local time. Uh, you know, I converted the UTC to local just so you can see. Uh, we just collected this. Now, you might say that, you know, I do not want to bring the data to my on-prem. I just want to use the link server. Uh, I want to keep it in the cloud within my Azure SQL database. So next I'm going to show that. So what I'm doing now, I'm connecting to my Azure SQL database and I'm creating a similar table into that database where I'm going to collect the size too. So 
So here I'm connecting there. I'm creating this table. You cannot use a use statement, so you always have to be in the right database context when you are using Management Studio for Azure SQL database. So now I created that table. Now I'm switching back. I'll be switching back to on-prem. So what I'm going to, what I'll be doing here, I created that table in Azure SQL database, but now I'll be using the link server from on-prem, run this T-SQL, it will grab the size, but it will save it in cloud over there within the same database. And we can look at that. As you, uh, you will see that table, I'm going to show you in a minute. So I, I restored uh, AdventureWorks from the sample backup as a sample database and I created that table. But from on-prem I ran the size, collection of the size, and it was saved into this table. Now, you know, we are only dealing with one database, so it's easy for us, but as you can see that in this instance itself, uh, I have four Azure SQL databases. And if I want to collect the same from all four, I have to have four link server and I have to go through those, uh, you know, which I do not find very nice to, you know, to do that way because eventually I'll end up with hundreds of link servers. So what I did the next solution I'm going to show you using a PowerShell function. We're going to use the same query that we used from SSMS to collect the size. We'll be using the same thing, but we will go to our resource group and using a loop, we'll look at every Azure SQL database that belong to that resource group. So it will go through every Azure SQL database, every Azure SQL server, go to every Azure SQL database and collect the same information. And here I'm scoping it uh, to a resource group, SQL agent demo, but you can uh, take it one level up. You can go to your subscription also. So let's run this. And sorry. Okay, so I'm running this now. It should go through all those databases, collect the size, and save it in my local instance. So I already ran it. Uh, I know you guys are a little bit behind, so I'm going to come back to Management Studio. And uh, if I run the look at the result, you know, the same table, you can see the time is 1854. Let me wait for you guys to see that. So 
So from that PowerShell function, it wrote into this table. And as you can see the time frame, and now I have data for all the tables. So it went through the both uh, server, as you can see different server name. And went through every database. Got the size and pulled it into my local instance and saved it there. Now if I have to schedule something, I'm not going to be sitting into my PowerShell console and run it manually every time. So what I can do, uh, that exact PowerShell code that we just ran, using a Windows task scheduler, I can schedule it. And in that way, it will run whenever I want, you know, once a day or whatever frequency I want. Also, I can go there and run it manually. And we can do this in an on-prem Windows host or with ISVM. So as you can see, this job is actually calling a PowerShell function that we just saw. And if I click the action now, you see that it's calling PowerShell.exe and um, it will call that, uh, that piece of code that we just ran from Visual Studio Code. And you can see the status now, it's running. And once it finishes, if we go to the management studio, you will see a bunch of new records with 1856 uh, timestamp, means uh, it collected another round of you know sizes for the Azure SQL database. Now I'm just showing you an example of collecting the size. You know I'm sure you're not. Uh, you know that excited about just collecting the size of your databases, uh, but you can replace my code uh, with anything that uh, you know you want to do, um, and it will it, you know it will perform. Be it update stats, uh, you want to purge your data, uh, you know whatever you want to do. So next uh, we want to move to Azure Automation, and before I do that. I'm going to show you in Management Studio two things that in the job database, currently we do not have any tables because I only created the database name job database, but I haven't turned on the Elastic Job Agent. So you will see that There is no table right now. Also under the store procedure, there is nothing. And I'm going to turn that on. I'm going to use PowerShell to Turn on Elastic Job Agent. And then we'll come back to the Management Studio and we'll see all the objects that got created. It's taking a OK, it's done. Now 
Will I know we have some pauses, so if you see any question, you can uh, stop me. Especially the lag, I have more pauses than I expected. <laughs> right on. Yep. Uh, uh, we're monitoring and um, uh, don't have any to report at this point. Sure. So, you know, you will see very soon that under the table, you will see a bunch of new tables got created. Also under the stir procedure, um, you know, the, the procs that I showed you before in the slide, all those will show up. And now we are ready to create jobs, create our target groups uh, and do whatever we want. So I'm going to keep this here. And in the interest of time and reduce some of the lag, I'm also going to start setting up our Azure Automation account. And it's a script that I'll be running from PowerShell. And uh, once you have a automation account created, uh, then you can start creating your runbook and schedule those runbooks also. So this is the script which uh, you know you will get uh, uh, when uh, Bill and Jason send you the link. So this already got created, so we'll go to the portal for first time and see what we have there. So we created an automation account name. Uh, it's not showing up here yet. UG demo two. Okay. So the automation account got created. And you'll see that on the screen in a few seconds. I'm just going to wait for it to come up. And once it's there, uh, we'll go to Runbook. And I created a demo Runbook. And I'm going to edit this. So because I do not want to type the whole thing right now, so I have the code right here. I'm just going to use that code. And again, I did not run. I did not write this from scratch. As um, I was telling you, I downloaded this from the gallery. And I actually gave credit. I kept the, um, you know, it was written by Microsoft um, employees. And uh, in 2014, I downloaded and then modified it a few times uh, based on what I needed. And as you can see here, there are a bunch of variables that I'm going to declare. And just for this demo purpose, I said fragmentation percent is 20. So if in the database there's a table named test rebuild, 
if there is an index that fragmented more than 20%, it will do a defrag and uh, it will bring it down. Uh, now again, I said, you know, people have very strong opinion about index maintenance. Uh, if that's something you do not want to do, that's fine, but uh, you can take this uh, framework and you can replace your code with whatever we need, you need. So now I'm going to set up a test table in one of our Azure SQL uh, database, and we will see that it's, defrag it's fragmented, and we'll use the runbook to uh, to fix it. So here I have a database name um, test runbook DB. I'm just creating a table, inserting 1000 rows. So I'm connecting here to my Azure SQL database. Uh, let me repeat that. So there's a database name here, test runbook DB. Creating a small table. 1000 rows. And then I'm going to update it again with some other value. And we'll see a fragmentation of about 40%. Now we can see that it's 39.8. And we'll go to the portal execute the run book. We'll come back here and see if this got fixed. And though we are connecting through SSMS, we are actually connecting to Azure SQL database. So everything happening in cloud. Uh, so we saved our run book. I'm going to a test pen. And this is a good thing that you know you can write your run book. You can save and you can test all from one place. And as was as I was saying before when I was running my slides, as you can see it's queued right now. So I really do not have a control up to the second that I want to run it right now. Uh, you know, I'm kind of dependent on, uh, you know, this to get on a compute resource and to get completed. And now you see completed. So there was a lag between when I press the run button and uh, when it is started, it goes to queue, then run and then get completed. So now if we go back, and check the fragmentation with the code that we used before, we'll see that it's down less than a percent. So if I like, you know, after my test, uh, I can now go and schedule this uh, for whatever time I want to run this. So we're done with this. So I think our last thing is our uh, SQL Server Elastic Agent that uh, we set up, so we're going to play with that. Uh, I think I'm not going to run through all the demos because you will get the uh, code and you can run it by yourself. But what I did uh, on this piece of code, I did set up all the permissions before the um, session started uh, because they are pretty simple one as you can see I'm just creating login um, you know I'm adding those into the role member I'm creating credentials and uh, giving them access to all my targets so I'll not run those code where I'm going to start is from line 81 or line 84 I already ran the permission setups so here as I said I'm creating a Okay, let it drop there, then I can explain. So right now to do anything, I need to be connected to my job database because all these store procs that I'm going to run, they only reside in job server in the job database. I mean, the server name can be anything. I just gave it a name just so it's obvious for us.
and you always have to have the right uh, database context because you cannot use a use statement here. So now I added a target group. We can see that our target group uh, is a server. Now I'm adding a job here. And I'm putting the credential names. My server name and where to put the output. Now I can look at the job definition. In you know in job steps and I also started the job. It's the same. T-SQL SP start job. And I can also go and look at the job status. And well, after I start the job, I can go and look at a job status, whether it's still running, I succeeded, failed, uh, or it, you know, it's in a waiting state. As you will see here that even though I ran one job, but it shows that uh, you know there are um, six rows because one is your job and then it created steps because it's uh, working through all the SQLs, all the databases uh, in my target group and they all succeeded. And I wrote the result into another database name DBA Warehouse. So we'll go and look at the result there, see if it did what it's supposed to do. And in this uh, in this uh, example, I'm really not collecting uh, database size anymore. So there are two DMVs that come with every Azure SQL database. Um, they collect performance metrics. So your CPU, IO and uh, everything, uh, the one one only keeps it for 15 minutes. I think the granularity is every few seconds. And the other one keeps it for over an hour. Uh, so this will be a good one. If you have a performance issue, you might want to collect it for, you know, for a few minutes and see what's going on. Uh, as you can see that, uh, you know, it rode into the into the warehouse. So in this, uh, you know, in the code, um, I have other target groups. I have elastic uh, pool and and other stuff. So I'm not going to run through this because they're pretty much same concept. You create a target group, you create your job, and then you can schedule your job or you can run it, see the status, and then you can go to uh, the warehouse and uh, you know look at your target. Now, do you need a warehouse? No, as I said before, I can write it into the same database. It's up to you. Whatever is your uh, you know your, your test. So I'm going to skip running this. I put enough comment that you should be able to go and uh, you know run this by yourself. And if you have any question again, like reach out to me, uh, I'll be able to help out. So next we'll talk about uh, function apps. And function app, again, it's uh, it, it's self a service. So, but you can leverage this to maintain your Azure SQL databases. And uh, one good thing is, um, and I'm not going to explain this in detail. Uh, I recently put this in a blog post. Uh, how you can use the so it's a service. It has its own identity. You can take this identity. And uh, you can give that identity. Make it a user in your Azure SQL databases. And give it proper privilege. So when you run your functions. You can get a token. And use that token to do your stuff. And what is the advantage that you do not have to pass a username password inside your function uh, or you do not have to keep it in your source control? So what I did here, uh, I set all this up uh, before that, 
but I also gave you, uh, you know, with the code set, um, when you get the code, you will get a full set of code for this function. And I put enough comment uh, that uh, you should be able to use it. So as you can see, this function app name is Boston Azure demo. And when I enable that setting, what it does, it creates a Active Directory object with the same name. And what you are seeing in the screen right now, I can go to my Azure SQL database and I already did that on the test runbook DB. I said create user Boston Azure demo from external provider means it's an AD account. And I gave it a DB owner, make it a member of DB owner. Now I make it a DB owner, you don't have to. Uh, depending on what you are doing, you can make it a member of other groups. And now in my function, if I go down and I wrote comments, you know, uh, how you can use managed service identity. I put three URLs. You can read about it. Uh, there are some tutorials. Uh, I also have a blog post that talks in detail about this. So now what I'm doing here, I'm going and getting a token and I am using that token in my connection string. Uh, you know, pointing to that Azure SQL uh, server to the database. And using that token, I will go and alter index all on the test rebuild uh, database. And I know, you know, you're not going to go and rebuild all the indexes like this. Um, I'm sure you will have some criteria, uh, but if this is just a sample. You can replace that piece of T-SQL with anything you want to do. So I'll go back to our uh, demo database uh, that and I'm going to create more. And I'll, I'll fragment that. Index more. And this time you will see a 98 person percent fragmentation. Then I'll go and run the. Function that I wrote. And we'll expect that that function will fix the fragmentation. So now you can see that I'm running that update statement and I'm checking the fragmentation. On that Azure SQL database on the table and it's 98% fragmented. And we'll go and run that function that you saw the code. I put it as a function here. And I'm expecting that function. To fix that fragmentation. And you can also schedule this. Uh, this functions so you don't have to come here and write it uh, and run it every time. Uh, you can schedule it uh, like our SQL Server agent jobs. So it's done. You can see at the bottom. Now we'll come here. Uh, we'll check the fragmentation again. And it should show that it's zero. So I'm going to go back to the slide. I'm done with the demo. Uh, Toyo, is this a good time to inject uh, a question? Sure. It's a perfect time. Okay. Great. Um, uh, if I if I need to have a schedule that creates a backup of my database and I want to store it somewhere like uh, blob storage for compliance reasons and maybe I want a, you know a permanent immutable copy there. What would be the best way to do that? So in Azure SQL database. Uh, you cannot take a backup the way today we take backup on prem. Uh, Microsoft create backups for us automatically. Uh, there are two different type of backups. One is point in time, one is a long term. Point in time, it can go up to 35 days max as of today. For long term, you can go up to 10 years. If you need more than 10 years, 
uh, you can reach out to Microsoft to make some arrangement just for your, uh, you know, your subscription or your resource. What you can do if you really need something, there's something called backpack. Uh, you can look at that. That's really not a backup. You're really scripting out all the objects and saving it, and you can deploy it against, uh, uh, you know, um, or, or, or you can restore a shell. Uh, you can create a shell and, and deploy it against that. So I don't know if that will answer your question, but even for compliance reason, like I told you, I work for a financial industry, very highly regulated, up to 35 days. I can get to point in time uh, with automated backup and I have long term retention backups uh, set up that I can go back up to 10 years. OK, so whoever asked that question, if you have any follow ups, please um, uh, let me know, but um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll Makes sense to me, uh, Toyo. Thank you for for that. Let's see if there are any others. Um, the big question about, um, I guess, is kind of backup related uh, too. But uh, any any comments about the uses of uh, geo replication uh, as a? Uh, it's, that's really all it's asking. <laughs> I don't know if you, if you could mention a little yeah. bit about that. I guess to give a little context. Sure, please. Sure, that was the other talk that you were talking at the beginning that I gave to your user group. Um, is a high availability solution, right? So, or, or a disaster recovery, right? So, um, or can be both, right? So it it, it depends on your uh, requirement. So today, when you spin up Azure SQL Database, by default you get three copies, but uh, you are not guaranteed to get three copies. Uh, doesn't guarantee you data center redundancy. So if you want data center redundancy, uh, you can have, um, uh, sorry, the term is not coming in my head. Um, there's a, it's called some group. Uh, you will still be within a region, but Microsoft will guarantee you that your three copies are three in three different data center, uh, which has different power, different cooling. Uh, so you have data center redundancy, but you still do not have region redundancy. So what will happen if all the data center of Microsoft that belongs to a region like call East US 2, Central US or East US is not available uh, and you need that kind of redundancy for your business, then yes, uh, uh, you can uh, set up always on availability group. Um, it's pretty much the same concept as on-prem and you can fail over to a different region. And now we, uh, Microsoft also recently released uh, availability group set. So you can have multiple Azure SQL database, though they are all uh, you know, individual databases sitting in a shell of a logical server, but you can group them uh, depend, you know, per app. So if you, so like before this, if I have three apps depending on three data, uh, if I have an app that depending on three Azure SQL database, I had to fail over these three independently. And that might bring some inconsistency uh, on my app uh, for transaction. Now I can uh, create a group and fail them over as a group. Uh, and you can also have a read only replica like we have on prem. Uh, so you get two URLs. Um, and um, like on prem, we have listener. Over there, you actually get two URL. Once you put both URL in your connection string, uh, you do not have to do anything uh, during your failover. It will automatically find out who is primary and you read right, uh, your write traffic will go to primary. You can send your read traffic to your, uh, to your uh, read node in a different region. Uh, uh, I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, ping me. I might have that whole slide deck that I gave into uh, Bill's uh, group. I can send that to you. Uh, there are, uh, I think the 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 title of the talk was a, a disaster recovery for Azure, HADR or uh, disaster recovery for uh, or high availability for Azure SQL database. Uh, you know, I had a couple of other options that I talked about talked about uh, that might uh, you know because this all comes with the with the cost, right? Uh, like I have apps, or I'm sure you guys have uh, that our business say you know if it's down for 24 hours. Uh, we are okay with its internal app or we can rebuild it from scratch. So, you know, we can run our processes again and we can rebuild. So 
for those apps, we are not doing, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the whole region redundancy. Uh, we are happy with the data center redundancy. Uh, so it all depends what you need. So we can we can definitely talk about that. Uh, excellent, thank you. Uh, I got the thumb up uh, indicator, so I think that uh, that clarified the question. And there's one final question here: is uh, uh, you, you're showing a number of different techniques for you know replacing the functionality that your SQL agent would handle, and you've shown different automation approaches. Do you personally have a preference of functions uh, versus runbooks, for example? Like, what's your go-to? Yeah, so my go-to was uh, Azure Automation uh, before the Ignite 2019. Uh, like I said, because you know I'm not a C sharp developer, uh, you know, I'll just comment that up front. Uh, you know I can write T SQL uh, pretty good. I can write PowerShell, and that's uh, how I do most of my, uh, you know, monitoring, uh, alerting, long-term trending. So when they, um, you know, they declared uh, that PowerShell is going to be supported. Uh, especially the security model that uh, I talked about, managed identity. Uh, I think this will be, uh, you know, my my go-to um, solution. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, uh, Toya. Um, that, that that clears the question queue. So I'm not going to talk about this slide. It's been up. I'm sure you guys are looking at it. So again, it's it's basically all I'm saying. It's multiple options. So, you know, it's a uh, you can have hybrid approach, multiple language. You know your limitations. Uh, you know what's your strong point where you are comfortable what your company need uh, you know think about all those and uh, one thing you want to uh, you know think through the way even uh, you know azure monitoring is a big uh, part of this right uh, uh, monitoring alerting it all come as a package uh, the way i'm trying to uh, you know design for myself today you know i cannot give you exact number i have you know i don't have uh, numbers in 100 of Azure SQL database, I'm in tens, twenties, uh, but I'm trying to design this in a way that after one year, two years, if I have 100 or more than 100 or 200, I can still scale this. I do not have to redesign. So just keep that in mind uh, before you make a final decision, but play with all, you know, some people are totally comfortable with the Elastic Job Agent to give you an example, but uh, why I did not uh, say that as my go-to choice, because it doesn't support PowerShell today. Uh, you know, and that's a kind of a showstopper for me because I have many, many scripts that uh, use PowerShell um, and, you know, with, with the DBA tools and all that. So, uh, so that's why I looked at it. It looked, you know, pretty appealing because, you know, everything looked like as on-prem, but, you know, I got, I didn't like it because I couldn't use this. Uh, so I created a uh, another slide with all the, resources. Uh, if you click one of these, it will take you to a URL. It's either a Microsoft documentation or, uh, you know, most of these are Microsoft documentation um, that I found helpful and, uh, you know, can give you more details uh, than a one hour talk. And uh, so here's that slide. And then, um, you know, the next slide will talk about my contacts. Again, if you need anything, reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer. And um, you know, uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you, Jason, Veronica, Bill, uh, for hosting me for third time. I do not take those as guaranteed, and uh, I appreciate that. Well, I, if if this was a live uh, in person event, I would uh, I would stand up and lead a uh, an applause. Uh, but we, you know, audience can't um, can't speak back to us here today. So um, on behalf of the audience, uh, you know, some virtual uh, applause back to you, uh, Toyob, that this was uh, very informative. Uh, I, uh, I've been using Azure and SQL DB for a long time, and, uh, and out of the, this, the prior talk that you gave in this one, I uh, picked up a, a number of uh, things I wasn't aware of, so it's uh, educational for me, which is a bonus. And on behalf of uh, Veronica and Jason and myself, uh, we thank you for for coming and uh, uh, educating us for, for a, a third time overall. Look forward to having you back in the future. The question queue is currently empty. If folks have them, uh, please um, blast them in there pretty quickly. Uh, we're uh, we're going to go into wrap up mode here. And just so that, uh, just to recap, uh, 
in a um, little less than two weeks on Wednesday, May 13th. That's a, a Wednesday, not a Thursday. Wednesday, May 13th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. We have Kevin Griffin, who will be talking about uh, 21st century background services with Azure Logic Apps and Azure Functions. And you'll see the description of that appear in the meetup pages, so you can read more about that there. Uh, but hope to see you in uh, in a couple of weeks. Then we have another one that's scheduled for uh, uh, a fortnight after that, and we'll get that posted as well. So uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Stay safe out there. And once again, a uh, big thank you, uh, Toya. Uh, appreciate the talk. Good night, everybody. Stay safe, and uh, see you another time. Over and out. All clear.